let's do some intros. So maybe if you want to share um, who you are, where you work, um, and what you do, and then we can kick off with some questions. And is it Gayatri? Yeah. I feel like I, I'm right. going to mess up. Okay. <laughs> you <right>. go first. <laughs> of course, why not? Um, anyways, um, love doing, you know, love seeing, reading your content, what you're doing in this space. Um, my name is Gayatri Kuar, um, and I currently work at uh, the B2B SaaS company called Ignite. Um, we are into the content uh, collaboration and content governance space. Um, and I am working in the ecosystem team. I lead uh, the productivity and the collaboration portfolio as a principal PM, as well as I look after growth uh, and bringing some metrics and the user orientation. Uh, now we are in the growth space. So it's a pre-IPO company. Uh, we've been 10 years strong um, and have around 16K customers. Uh, so, and by the way, prior to that, you know, the care, you know, Christina was kind of interested in like, you no, know, me joining this panel because I have a very diverse experience. I, before this, I was in the B2C space. I was in Microsoft working on the Skype consumer product, both on the mobile growth side into emerging markets. And then later on in the board framework, like when we talk about the chat boards and other things, and I think that you are familiar with this with live person, but I was working on the messaging bootstrapping the ecosystem for that. And before that, I was in the Motorola Mobility as it was acquired by Google and working in the OEM space on the mobile platform, but the app, eco app ecosystem piece of it, so. So much good experience. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Um, Sonia, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm Sonia, I'm based in um, New Zealand. Um, and I'm currently working at um, Zero within the ecosystem space there. Um, and so I look after the developer experience. So that's um, uh, anything to do with, you know, documentation support um, and yeah, anything that contributes to the overall developer experience of, of our developer platform. Um, I've previously worked uh, more in the integration space, so so uh, building and driving a um, integrations uh, strategy and roadmap, sort of being the customer of, of external APIs of, of other companies. Um, uh, yeah, so I've sort of had a bit of experience on, on both both ends of that. Awesome. As I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Zero. Uh, really love the the DevRel team too. I've always had a great time with you guys. Uh, Vlad, you're up. Yes, hi, um, Vlad Kuznetsov. First, want to thank uh, organizers, um, Christina and Kelly. Awesome panel. I am uh, right now with Life Person. I see Gayatri used to work there, and what we're doing is uh, conversational AI uh, for brands to interact with their um, uh, consumers. Uh, we have about eighteen thousand customers. Uh, but where I'm focusing is mostly on enterprise um, segment, about thousand of, you know, those top fortune uh, companies in all um, in all segments. What I'm uh, we also adding the new channel to customers voice, and so I'm on the voice team, uh, and also single threaded leader. It's kind of Amazon term. Uh, for the integrations in analytics and workforce engagement management, which basically extends the the area we that we work to the adjacent areas in kind of seek us contact center as a service quadrant. And I'm based in Silicon Valley. Excellent. Thank you for it's one disclaimer. Well, I didn't work on life person, but I talked to your co-founders because I was in the conversational AI space. Uh, when I worked on Skype board framework uh, in the Microsoft side. So, so much overlap. Anyways, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, Doug. Thanks. And yeah, thanks again for pulling the panel together. I always enjoy these conversations with peers. So, my name is Doug Gould. I'm the head of ecosystem at LaunchDarkly. We are a, a growth stage startup uh, based out of Oakland, which develops a feature management platform. And what I do is I look after our integration strategy and our integration portfolio. We've got around 40 plus different points of interoperability uh, or integrations into various different categories of services. 
So myself and my team look after the strategy behind those. We also own uh, the strategy around our technology partner program, which supports our open source integration framework, whereby third parties can actually develop and ultimately publish integrations into LaunchDarkly. And then we also just overall do a mapping of the, the ecosystem. So as our platform continues to grow and mature, we look at new areas of investment from a category perspective and where we feel like we need to be plugging gaps with partners that our, our product isn't able to, to fill. Um, as we go after, for example, more enterprise customers and continue to sell into new areas and verticals. Prior to that, I was at the Amazon Web Services. So I was on the business development team for a number of years, primarily working with growth stage startups. Um, spent some time at Microsoft through an acquisition of a startup that I was at called Xamarin, which was a mobile framework. And then also spent some time at the startup side, partnering with AWS a company called Cloudability, which was a cost management platform. And so I ran business development there looking after our services as well as our integration partners. So I've had a pretty broad range of experiences from the platform integration business development side around integrations themselves, and then also services partners and actually co-selling and taking to market around Alliance and channel. Thank you all for joining us and taking time out of your days across multiple time time zones. Sonia, I don't even know what time it is where you are, but I'm going to guess it's early, very early or very late. Not too bad. Nine o'clock in the morning. Is, is oh, that's good. not so bad. <laughs> um, cool. So let's get started. Um, so taking it from the very top, what are the best proactive processes for understanding what new integrations or new use cases customers would derive the most value from? Sonia, um, go ahead. Check this off. Um, cool. So yeah, I guess uh, one of the first things I'd be looking into is um, as a baseline, having a strong understanding of, of how your product's currently being used as a standalone product. So working with obviously user research teams and product marketing, customer experience and sales and partner teams, um, just to make sure we have that strong understanding of, of our product on its own. Um, and then um, after that, I'd also be trying to build an understanding of um, your customer's ecosystem or the portfolio of products that your customers are using. So, um, and from there, really understanding how your product is going to fit into that um, portfolio. Because um, from there, we sort of start to see potential interdependencies between your product and other products that are, that are being used um, by your customers. Um, sometimes I found when you when you do this, you can kind of find quite clear areas where um, customers might already be connecting the two products, but they're just doing it in, in a sort of manual workaround kind of way. Um, for example, something like uh, an HR import of users from from one system to another through um, a, a spreadsheet that's been exported and imported or uh, manually inputting a timesheet from a time tracking tool into um, your accounting product. Um, so those things I'd be researching and investigating first to understand the opportunities that lie with um, your existing customers, um, along with some, some competitor research. Um, but I'd also go beyond just the existing products that your customers are using and uh, look into what other products are working towards a goal that might be aligned or somewhat aligned to your goal um, and seeing which markets or customer segments that, that you might share with some of these other platforms, other um, products, and can potentially create um, a partnership with. Uh, and I found in the past that sometimes that can mean um, looking at uh, people who might off the face of it be um, your competitors, but in an ecosystem world, your competitors can sometimes um, become a key part of your, of your ecosystem or a type of, of ally in a way. Um, I guess, for example, if you look at uh, Jira and Asana off the, as standalone products, the initial perception might be that um, in some areas they're in real competition with each other. Um, but obviously they've, they've learned that they need to um, integrate and create touch points between parts of their product to be able to, to leverage each other. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that aspect of it is what makes researching um, for um, integrations really interesting from the ecosystem and network. Um, perspective. Awesome. Thank you for well, that. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, what she said, 100%. Um, but I basically established some playbooks as I 
you know, we all have a pain that there are so many integration requests and there is bombardment from the cells and BD and uh, different channels and what you're doing and how it is aligning to your company's objectives and the goals. So short off, you know, this is something, a lesson I learned from my VP at the Microsoft. And I've taken that playbook now in the, the startup I was, uh, which was about the chatbot company and now into the Ignite. Um, it apl is applicable. You just need to tweak it a bit. It's about establishing, starting with a strategy, what the goals, what the stage uh, of the company it is. Um, and then going from there, I basically come out with a partner framework. Uh, and what I do is that I look at the portfolio um, as ecosystem portfolio completely with the first party applications, which we are building integrated into all our clients. You know, we have omnichannel clients. We have a web and windows and desktop and the mobile clients. So there are some integrations which are deeply embedded and people use it every day for the productivity and collaboration purposes. There are some use cases which are like analytics, people who just use one off time. There are some use cases which is just simple data connectors because we want to get the content within our platform so we can govern that. They are our two product lines. So just looking at what and where you are, what is your company's vision? What are the partnerships where you can fulfill that gaps and like you know, uh, meet those objectives? And what stage you are at. So currently, for example, the stage Ignite is at, but even when I was at with the Skype, monetization was never a goal. We weren't at that stage, we were monetizing the partnership. We were really looking into the adoption and the retention as a core matrix. So keep that perspective in mind. I look at the overall existing integrations I have and I tier it into the tier one, tier two, tier three. Depends on each tier, it requires basically certain marketing resources, the product resources, the enhancement you possibly would do. That will define it and that's what I basically socialize and work with across the teams, different PMs and people who is coming with the intact request. Uh, so see that, you know, what we're going to do and what we're not going to do for the given quarter, or let's say in like, you no know, couple of quarters for this year, for example, and where our focus would be and why. From there on, I will divide it between two things. Existing integration, I look up our Nostra KPI is the active user, monthly active users. I mean, they are monthly active domains as well in B2B, which makes sense from the RIMRR perspective, but what I seek coming from the B2C side is end user adoption, driving the adoption like, you know, like kind of a Slack model, which we know that if they are using it, they are retained, then there is a value. So it's top 10 to 20 integrations, we have a deeper analytics and what we look for. And overall, I look for month to month, taking all API keys of what we have in market. Uh, and we look for month to month adoption um, for the company's wise metrics and the users. Now, given that slotted down for the integrations and then you see where you are, what is the, you know, basically BD importance, so the portfolio strategic importance, what is the company importance? And depends on that, we basically plan what we want to enhance and what we want to invest further in more use cases. And then there are some other cases which I'm working on currently, as well as within the Skype, they are strategic. It's a brand new thing, it's a differentiator, nobody has done before. That's the reason like you no know, people will let's say leave Dropbox and Box and come to Ignite. Uh, and that is number one priorities. Now that one requires a whole together different you know, UX approach and the research options and requires a longer planning cycles. And I can go that in detail if you wanna know what are those research methods because that's the topic today. And that one takes a different approach altogether in my purview. And we basically allocate a time for that as well in our portfolio. That was an amazing, robust response. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Vlad, I think you unmuted as well. Yeah, um, well, I'm in product management, but um, I've been owning sort of end-to-end -end, uh, the integration strategy uh, for this particular segment. And uh, I first had to present the opportunity to all the way to the top, to the kind of executive leadership team, and um, kind of prove the case that we need to 
uh, sort of build this integration. And in general, I think companies uh, in, in product looked at certain product you could buy, build, or partner, right? And so uh, within our company, there was an attempt to buy the functionality in the space, uh, but the research um, that I took that included uh, looking for analysts reports, speaking to experts in the field, as well as uh, understanding the customers uh, that you could get from like customer success managers and some of the sales folks, basically proven that there are established vendors in this field and that we will not be able to force on this, on the customers, the product that we're building. And so we kind of decided to basically maybe never even ship that, um, that product, but instead focus on the integrations strategy. And over there, there's kind of like a typical prioritization um, steps that you could take by understanding where your customers are asking, what's the size of those players, who is kind of up and coming, growing, who is maybe kind of declining, and that's how you would um, prioritize the integrations. Um, yeah, so um, so that that would be kind of my answer, and and I agree also with the previous statements that there might be already some nascent integrations where professional services or the customers themselves build those connectors. And if uh, the company goal is to decrease friction with your existing customers, it, it definitely worth offering something out of the box in this case. Awesome. And that um, something that you just mentioned uh, relates to a question that we got actually through the website um, about making the case for leadership. So uh, what concrete metrics have you guys used in the past to sell leadership on a particular integration? Well, well in, that's in our, a loaded question, right? <laughs> so go ahead, well, if you want. Well, since I kind of just built for that, it typically involves, you know, kind of like number of customers um, that already attempted to do it. Um, I've presented, for example, number of existing sort of professional services integrations and uh, done also with some consulting partners. There were some cases where customers sort of unhappy without that integration, but they don't want to purchase the, the custom solutions that are done by professional services. Also, sometimes it's like important issue that helped me, for example, to, to push this, uh, some lead analysts uh, set as criteria to be included, let's say, in SICA's quad uh, quadrant contact center as a service, you kind of must to support this functionality. And since, uh, you know, our company was not planning to, plan, uh, planning to build that, uh, a partnering is the best approach for this. Well, yeah. about the business case, if you would ask, um, I would, you know, depends on type of an initiative, right? The existing integration that is bottom up, the customer request, sales request, the churn reasons, the NPS, all that data feed into and the frequency of that uh, response, which what we generally drive is that we don't price our integrations, it's horizontal. So I want to see how that is generically going to be applicable to our audience. Um, and we have established processes now. We are not really a startup. We are like 10 years in existence. So we have product board and other tools we acquired where customers can make that, you know, basically request which we attach to our roadmap. And we also make some explicit indications and other things available in the portal where they can upvote, like kind of a user voting. So we can address that, you know, what the customer's use cases and things are attached and that goes into the business case. Um, for something which is not explicit customer ask, and we are doing for strategic reasons. Um, for those ones, of course, that goes with your traditional product marketing thing, competitive analysis, differentiator, what is our value proposition, what is going to be SWOT for us, um, what we think that, you know, of initial TAM, you know, you could do bottom up if there is a similar integration or the top down modeling, and you can give them cohort or sort of a GTM approach. What is in it for business, right? How is going to move the metrics? Whatever metrics you're going to move. For us, like at this stage, as we preparing for IPO, 
I think retention is the most and the key metrics everybody's looking into, even our board members. So anything which I tie down to that, um, that is definitely a win-win. I don't think any question is going to be asked by my CEO or anybody if I tie to that. Um, and of course, on the growth side, I also look after growth because I've just taken the Reforge classes and had strong interest in that. So we look after, I look, look after, you know, growth and the data side of the house. I work with the data analytic team uh, and we came up with the regression model tying the growth lever, number of integrations used, um, how that, that causes or attributes to the product stickiness and the less churn. That is something, you know, when I joined, I've done that the first exercise and we were part of the BD team. The product team was kind of metrics. After that, it just hammered into everybody's head. Now everybody's in company using that, that that's the growth lever and this is how this team adds value. And the, now we are reporting to the chief product officer and the, ideally in the product organization, which I think is we are more empowered and we are metrics into BD and the partner marketing managers, right? And that organization. So I think proving that what and why people should invest in ecosystem, what is overall growth value or some sort of a matrix where you tie down to the lagging matrix, super, super important. After that is just a normal product management 101, where you're going to show the business case, depends on what initiatives you're working on. Doug, do you have something to add? Yeah, I think it gets back to some of what was discussed in the previous answers to the last question around being really clear around prioritization. I think that that's the, foundation that a strong strategic business development team operates on because whether you're in a scaling startup or even an established organization it's important for people to be able to tie things back to the consistency in the message from bd i think in instances where i've come in or been involved with uh, challenges working across different functions it's because there's a very ad hoc approach towards jumping on every single opportunity. So I think when it comes to building that credibility, making a case up to leadership, the, the foundation in a framework and being able to evaluate certain opportunities, that's the piece that should be drawn out first and then distributed throughout the organization so that people understand when you're even discussing an integration opportunity that it's gone through some level of filter prior to even arriving to people to begin with. So I think that's a really important piece that I would clarify is the credibility that either yourself as a BD leader or your team needs to really build prior to being able to, to go into the room to have that discussion. It's really important as you think about how the, the function is able to operate. And I think, for example, being in part of the, the product organization, being able to have more alignment, there's certain areas where you can have a a larger impact, but you're really needing to think about effectively managing up as a, a BD leader because these these operations around integrations can be very expensive. So that's one thing that I, I really wanted to emphasize is that the work needs to be done before you even get to building that business case where people understand, okay, for me at, at LaunchDarkly, I have these three specific areas and then I have a, a framework by which we evaluate individual partners so I can bring that into the discussion, but ultimately I know that if it's a large impact integration, I'll, I'll need to make the case individually, but people should at least know there's consistency in what actually brings that to the certain point. Yeah, that's so helpful. And I, I, I'm smiling because I've been on the delivery side for so many years and had that conversation where it's just constantly being peppered with requests and having to figure out that rubric and framework, like what's actually strategically valuable because there's only so many humans uh, that could work on these things at one time. Uh, Sonia, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add to the point that Doug made about, um, I guess, doing that upfront work and having that strong foundation before you're actually making that business case and, and sitting in that room to, to have that conversation about prioritizing or investing in certain areas. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things to, I guess, especially as a product person to think about um, with that kind of foundation is making sure that you have really um, strong metrics and, and um, measures of success that you feel really confident about and that they um, really, um, reflect some kind of um, value to the company. So I think particularly when we're talking about um, external APIs and, and how we measure 
the importance of, of that and investing in that. It's the difference between um, just uh, working with uh, measuring time to hello world as, as you know, a measure of API adoption or usage. And um, that is, is sort of a metric that kind of can sit very much on its own. Um, whereas if you're measuring something like um, the number of active APIs that are being used by your marketplace apps or um, the monthly number of developers that are using active APIs that are published on your app store. That, that kind of metric um, is something that's a lot stronger and has um, a lot more strategic context to it and, and is something that can be a lot more useful when you are getting to the point of, of having to um, prove return on investment and to, to actually be building a business case for um, investment as well. I love that idea. And I, I love the idea too of measuring success in sort of like phases, like there's going to be the long tail with the adoption, but getting some of those quick wins, I think can be really helpful within an organization to demonstrate that what you're doing is, is valuable and is working. Um, to kind of go along with what we've been talking about here, um, you know, integration and partnerships uh, are really cross departmental. I think it touches almost every part of an organization, except maybe HR. Um, and I'm curious what internal processes you guys think should be set up uh, so that other departments like sales, CS, engineering, uh, marketing are gathering the research that helps you prioritize and figure out what to build. Doug? I'll jump back on the prioritization and just make sure that you have a clean and easy to understand list of what the priorities are something we use internally confluence as an internal wiki and i think that's really important to have pages there that you can point all these different stakeholders towards and a single source of truth around all these things what i've seen as a challenge is when people get very slide or powerpoint presentation focused and then what happens is you have different iterations of different presentations floating around and people might have seen the presentation three months ago but they didn't see the latest one and i think that really causes again that consternation around people not really remembering what the strategy is and being unclear about what the end result or the outcome is so i think really clean documentation is something that's really important for a bd team and using whatever resources you have, even if it's just a one pager in Google Drive that you can point people towards with a link to be able to see this is what our kind of annual or quarterly BD strategy and plan is and here's our priorities. So I would say that is probably one of the most important things in terms of being, uh, being available, or making other people kind of jump on board. Um, the other one is just really being respectful of other people's time. So like I was saying, making it really well known that when things do come and, and there is an official ask that it's something that aligns to what their priorities are that you're not diverting them off course but you're actually trying to accelerate whatever these other kpis are that are shared across the organization i think it's important to be a very good team player so when you're going into a marketing meeting not trying to stand up a separate work stream but understanding if their priorities are to get in front of more enterprise customers being able to say you want to build a go to market around an integration because it does have a large presence of potential enterprise users. So I think it's about being tied into a lot of the other priorities and making sure that you're aligned to that as you're building your own business case for why they should resource what you're doing. Doug, I would say one thing, if you are dealing with multiple presentations and outdated copies, you should use our platform, plug for Ignite. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, yeah, I think I will just go with and echo the comments, uh, the framework. You socialize that with the BD cells, CSMs, whatnot. I also have the dashboard uh, and the Tableau dashboard where we have all sort of metrics and the adoptions for the key integrations. Um, and you slice and dice by the industry and the by MRR or ARR or whatnot, right? And I basically, you know, do a quarterly reviews with that, with our CSM and the different teams who are selling, who are front facing. So they know that, you know, if there is a new customer coming, let's say in the construction domain, and we currently show the data on the dashboard that are existing construction domains, they are using, let's say, you know, these three or four integrations, which is part of their key workflows. They basically advise and suggest, okay, why don't you use this? So, you know, they find immediate value and the platform stickiness. And then therefore, you know, we can get their options because it's just uh, overall work. So we educate them, we give them a tools, we give them data. Uh, besides that, you know, we do customer summit and the quarterly reviews where just like any other product team, we show our roadmap, what is upcoming, 
gather the feedback. That is one source of the research. We go on a Slack exchange. We do the customer interviews. Uh, for the large inter, you know, cross and omni-channel integrations, if I'm building, for example, building co-editing experience with the Microsoft suite. For that, we even go more further with the UX research and the UX interviews and the prototype reviews. I mean, this integration, if you say, is no different than um, what possibly other product managers would do. I mean, it's not that, you know, it's, it's again, goes back to product management 101. Um, I've done in past like APIs as well, like Sonia coming to your, you know, area. We basically, you know, when I was at Skype, we wanted to on the mobile side, we want to penetrate the emerging markets. That was one of the big part we had that, you know, India was the market, which was identified by the senior exec and we had a sponsor. And uh, we basically decided to go with the partnership side because it's less a cost to build. And we had a strategic and the incumbent partner. Uh, who had the large enough skill in those markets which we were seeking. Now, how would I basically go out? Essentially, we were giving them SDK in the interface with the Skype billing use cases and the APIs and the contact books and whatnot, just to do voice and video calling. But we didn't start with that. We started with like, you know, again, the design sprint three days, jointly sitting with the strategic partner who was building the entire Office 365 portfolio into their devices on Android side. We sat there, saw that, you know, what is your strength? What is our strength? What we could do together, came up with this vision overall, you know, at the end of the three days with the UX and PMs and other stakeholders with the product lines. Coming back, that was the piece of, you know, some sort of what you call it primary research. We also had secondary research and inputs like analysis reports or could be ethnographic studies you've done for the business or you know diary studies where you can focus on where your MVP and the first solution would be. And after that, you know, we came to individually and we did the customer, I did the customer surveys to hone down what would my be first research and the joint use cases. And from that on, we defined APIs after that. Then I went to the billing team and localization team or other teams and saying, okay, you have this internal APIs or partner APIs, let's evolve to the partner API. Let's work with the first partner we have in board to basically mature that to the point. And then once we would have been you know, successful launching this, we did launch this in Mobile World Congress in 2016, and we did raise some certain adoption, then we will make it public. And that SDK would be given to all the customers who are basically looking to integrate Skype modalities into their devices, right? So this is, again, the roadmap, and I've taken the same approach as other product managers would have taken, but the APIs was not at the forefront at this moment, right? Because it was not just giving APIs to the consumers. We were building the entire product and the UX and joint UX and the you know, integration together. And from there, we walked backwards. And so what APIs we need to make to make this happen. And then you know, open it up our portal and APIs to the other developers to build on top of it. So. Yeah, excuse me, I think we just have time for one more question. And this is sort of um, in your realm and also in, in Sonia's realm about um, developer feedback on your extern on external APIs. I know, uh, Sonia, you probably get uh, quite a lot of that in your current role. Um, so I guess, how do you aggregate that? How do you kind of synthesize that to determine where the market is headed? And what's the best way to get that feedback and turn it from like an antidote, an antidote to data? Because we all know that um, we all know that developers have a lot of feelings about a lot of things. So Sonia, I'm curious about what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, I guess, uh, first of all, I would be trying to make sure that we're responding to the developer feedback and feature requests with, um, with questions so that we're getting a deep understanding of, of how our developers are working with their API. So not just from a technical perspective, but also what are they actually trying to achieve with that API um, what what are their overall use cases? Because um, that can really give um, give a lot more insight into the market um, demand and what your APIs are actually enabling in an end product. Um, and I yeah I think you know some of this feedback or queries may may come to you that are you know specifically about the APIs. But um, if we're trying to get an idea of the broader market and market demand, um, I guess engaging that conversation to get that sort of context um, can be uh, really useful. And something else I've been thinking about, I guess, in the last year or so is that 
Um, developers are kind of increasingly sitting at the forefront of the sort of the, I guess, the sales and acquisition phases when, when a company or product is thinking or considering the feasibility of building with your APIs. So I think we're definitely heading more and more towards developers, um, not just being the, the builders and the, the build and execution phase of integrations, but actually contributing to that kind of feasibility assessment in the earlier stages of the integration. Um, as Yuri, we call that the discover and initiate phase. Um, so I think as a way of kind of, um, you know, using the feedback alongside with, with some more concrete data, I think there's definitely value in looking into how the developer feedback um, mirrors up to even some of the data that's connected to some of your funnel metrics, like how many of your developers who are maybe accessing your APIs and, and docs for free with, you know, on a kind of freemium model, how many of them are actually converting to active API calls? Um, and similarly, how, how, how many are moving from that testing sandbox stage to, to live products that are actually providing you value? Um, so, yeah, I definitely think there's a way to bring in that feedback and, and that type of data to create a fuller picture of, um, of what's going on. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? We are just about at time. One thing I also workflow oh. or GitLab and other things, the developer feedback, right? If you are mature enough. Yeah, and Doug, Doug go ahead. I totally agree yeah. if you've got the workflow yeah. stuff that helps. Sorry, Doug, go ahead. I would say in addition to that too, it whether you have a, a web page around developers with some code references and or sample code just showing people what's possible. I think that's one thing I've learned is that it's it's important to give people an opportunity to do some of that discovery and, and show them what's possible. I think when you put an API out there, and especially if you're anything earlier than maybe a, a really late stage company with a pretty broad active developer base, it's harder for you to be able to solicit that feedback. You won't hear a whole lot, but if you're able to just pull together two or three examples of what people can actually build with the API, I think that gives people a starting point and they'll be more comfortable being able to make suggestions about areas improvement or new categories. Um, companies like Stripe, for example, have amazing documentation pages, and that isn't something that you need to build from day one, but something that is a, a really good example that teams might be able to look at initially. Totally. It's like we're not just building APIs for the sake of it, right? It's, it's actually <laughs> creating something um, yeah, that's useful. Yeah, at, at larger scale, if you have enough, as you said, uh, developers, I think it's interesting just to look at simple things like the Google Analytics of your help docs, like how, like where are people going, which objects are they returning to, how long are they spending on the page, and that could be because they really want to use that endpoint, or the docs are really bad and they're <laughs> they're confused. Um, so it's interesting to even do something as simple as that.